Uh, hi, I'm Cory Doctorow, and the folks at Edge Riders have asked me to say a few words to you about this upcoming event on November the 11th in Brussels. So I'm a science fiction novelist, as you can see. I'm also an activist, and I, I work on lots of issues, mostly pertaining to uh, technology and, and how we can make it work for us instead of controlling us, how we can seize the means of computation, for lack of a better phrase. And um, the folks at Edge Riders have asked me to say a few words about the relationship between science fiction and our economic imagination, what it means to imagine not just a few tweaks here and there to the system, but a radically transformed economy, one oriented around a sustainable future, one that's pluralistic, one where we can all thrive, one where we can avert the looming terror of the climate catastrophe, and maybe snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, maybe imagine a future in which we can organize our economy not just around kind of lifeboat rules where we scrimp and make do with what little remains after our incredibly foolish neglect of this entirely visible, entirely foreseeable, entirely preventable crisis, but a joyous future, one in which we imagine an economics that supports something that is hard and important, but ultimately very good for us, nourishing for us. A, a future where we devote ourselves and we devote the lives of our children and their children and their children to the hard, long project of remediating the catastrophic destruction that we've wrought to this planet, of saving the people who are in harm's way, or of working with them to save ourselves and themselves, that we, an economy oriented around solidarity and the knowledge every day that you've done something amazing and that the next day there'll be something amazing to do too. After all, that's something we've done before. Uh, the, not the first person to make a comparison between, say, the Green New Deal and the original New Deal, or the uh, build up for war and the um, incredible resources that were there to be had and the energy that was to be found and the solidarity and the satisfaction of knowing that you were working for something important. Um, if we could do it then, we could do it now. You know, as Paradise, uh, as, as Rebecca Solnit wrote in her amazing book, A Paradise Built in Hell, which is the book that inspired me to write that novel over there, Walk Away, uh, People who live through crises don't experience them as the moment in which they realize that they have nothing in common with their neighbors and they should get them out of the way uh, so that more of the scarce resources can be had for them and themselves. Crises are when the background refrigerator hum of petty grievance stops and leaves behind this kind of ringing silence. And in that ringing silence, you realize that you have so much more in common with the people around you and that all of it um, swamps any differences or, or uh, fights or feuds you, you might have had beforehand. It's a very inspiring idea. It's the idea that I turn to whenever I despair because it's very easy to despair right now. In science fiction, you know, it can do more than simply expose us to ideas. I mean, there's lots of people doing that right now. The modern monetary theory people and the um, you know bright green future people and the technologists with cool sequestration tools and interesting and better ways to imagine resolving disputes or uh, allocating resources or just um, you know solving some of the hard problems of being a lot of people on a finite planet. Science fiction can give you a kind of architect's rendering that you can fly through of the emotional lived experience of a better future. It can give you the hope that can keep you going even when things seem hopeless. Hope, after all, is not the belief that things will automatically come out all right. That's just optimism. It's a kind of fatalism. It's the belief that things get better and so we can just sit down, stand down and things will get better no matter what. Hope is the belief that if we can take one small step that materially improves our circumstances, 
that we'll gain a new vantage point, and from there we'll be able to see the next step we can take to improve our circumstances more. That although the terrain is unknowable, and although it's too complex for us to ever map a path from A to Z, that the terrain can still be traversed by wayfinding as we go with people of goodwill around us. So that's why I'm excited about this event. Um, that's why I think this event has the potential to plant a seed in the minds of hundreds of people, people who are already thinking about what a better future might look like, people who haven't lost hope, but who are trying to figure out together what that next step we can take might be. And planting that seed can fertilize a whole forest that grows out of it. Um, after all, we are not isolated. We live with other people. Our despair is because we despair for the fate of those people around us, and our hope must be that we can bring those people with us. I used to work uh, for an NGO called the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I still contract for them, but I used to work as their European director. And one day, uh, an NGO founder called James Love, who started an organization called Knowledge Ecology International, gathered a whole group of us in Geneva in the basement of Médecins Sans Frontières on a Sunday afternoon before a big UN meeting. And we drafted a thing called the Access to Knowledge Treaty, which was about safeguarding universal access to all human knowledge for every human being on Earth. And as we sat there drawing up this wish list of things that we hoped the states of the Earth would do to protect the people who lived in them and enrich their lives, Someone said to Jamie, what makes you think that we can do this? How can you possibly believe that we sitting here in this basement in Geneva on a Sunday morning could make such a profound change in the world? And Jamie said, you know, all that stuff that we fight over, right? This, the, the enemies arrayed against us, the institutions that have done so much to destroy our world, the, the World Trade Organization, that agreement was cooked up in a room less than a kilometer from this one by people who are no smarter, no better at conveying their ideas, and no more imaginative than you. And if they can do it, then so can we. And the idea of gathering with a couple hundred people who really believe this stuff, but are looking for a common path up and through our current moment, a future where we dedicate ourselves to putting this planet and all the species that live on it back together in a way that sustains us and our children and their children and their children. I can't think of a better thing to be doing on that day in Brussels. So the last thing I want to tell you about is why you should financially support this event. Um, these kinds of things they don't have a big financial constituency. Uh, the business model for saving the planet is that the planet gets saved and we all get to live a better future. And that makes it a public good, right? not an easily capturable one. The future uh, of a sustainable planet that has a business model, <laughs> that's the one in which you get rich selling, uh, you know, machine guns and MREs to people who plan to hide in luxury bunkers until the dust settles. The future where we all have a place, its business model is that everybody has a place. And I know that these are hard times. Um, the same looter class that has cooked things so that we can't have policies that avert this foreseeable, terrible, existential, looming crisis, also have taken all the money. That's after all where they get the money to fund the doubt that paralyzes our institutions, that hastens the end of our species. And so, although I understand that you don't have much, no, I don't have much, I hope that you will dig in and think about buying a ticket in order to attend. Um, this kind of work 
it's hard to say where it'll go. Maybe this one will just fizzle out. But, you know, this kind of work, it's like buying a lottery ticket. Uh, you probably won't win, but someone wins the lottery every time. And if you buy enough tickets, your chances of going up go up. Sometimes the work that we do is financial, buying a ticket. Sometimes it's normative, having the hard conversation with the people around us. Sometimes it's legislative, going to lobby someone. And sometimes it's technological, building the tools that help people live a better, more sustainable, richer, happier life. And this is a moment where there's a pretty easy intervention to be had, something that, that you personally can do. So I hope to see you there. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, even if you don't make it, I hope to see you in the future. Thank you.